Renee, welcome, welcome. Good morning, Megan, and good morning, everyone, and welcome to Conversations with Great Performers. Today, we are honored to welcome Brian Bell to From the Podium. Brian is a well-known producer, interviewer, and announcer, called by many as the Boston Symphony Orchestra historian, Brian joins us today to speak about his career in broadcasting and also to celebrate Martin Bookspan's 94th birthday. Brian has referred to Marty as the greatest classical music media personality of the 20th century. And we'll find out much more later as we go on. You can hear Brian's broadcasts doing the best of the Boston Symphony Orchestra every Saturday night at 6 o'clock on WAMC or WMNR. Welcome, Brian. We're thrilled to have you. Thank you. So we are finding you uh, close to Boston, which is your home. Am I right? Correct. I always see you in the archives of the Boston Symphony Orchestra. I'm certain that you have a bed somewhere there. <laughs> I'm like a pig in mud uh, at the archives. There's uh, so much between photos and tapes and papers and uh, various letters. There's just so much to uh, get sucked in uh, at the archives that invariably when I go there, I'm looking for something and I end up discovering three other things in the process. And so uh, it's, it's one of those things where you think you're going to be able to get out of there in a certain period of time. I just can't. I can't tear myself away from it. There's just so much fascinating stuff there that I, uh, I just love it. I just love it. What are, the, what are some of the more interesting pieces of information that you have found? Oh, gosh. Um, well, sometimes the letters and the photographs uh, just are jaw-dropping. Uh, things that I'm not supposed to know, uh, that Bridget Carr uh, may not, uh, she's the, the chief archivist of the, of the Boston Symphony, uh, that I just happen to be able to see and uh, will shed a whole different um, light on, on things and basically flesh out um, or change some of my preconceived notions of what happened to the Boston Symphony in the past. There's certainly been a, a lot of history during all of our music directors and so many things. Uh, we're fortunate that uh, this year, with all that's been going on in the world, uh, we do have the 2020 online festival. And um, we're grateful to have that in, in the Berkshires, although so many of us miss live music. It's, it's just not the same, and we look forward to having it returned, I hope, as soon as possible. Absolutely. So, uh, I wanted to uh, ask you a little bit about your background, because you started out as a French horn player. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Michigan, uh, and so I, uh, I actually saw Paul Paré conduct the Detroit Symphony, but really most of the concerts uh, that I attended in my youth uh, were conducted by um, Sixteen Erling, but I remember, oh, unforgettable concerts. Uh, uh, pianist who really made a great impression upon me was uh, Geza Anda, the, the Hungarian pianist. Um, so I, uh, I studied uh, there. Eventually I went to Interlaken for high school while um, studying with the principal horn of the Detroit Symphony, Eugene Wade. Uh, and Boy, even then was a, a connection because the lead conductor at the Interlock and Arts Academy in 1973 was a man by the name of Thor Johnson. Now Thor was in the Tanglewood class of 1940. He was the same senior member of the Tanglewood class of 1940. Uh, he was 27 years old at the time. In addition to studying with Kusevitsky, he also studied with Felix Weingartner and Nikolai Malko. And, uh, Thor was my first conductor interview. I took a radio, <laughs> I was French horn major, piano minor, radio minor. So I had a major and two minors in Interlock. And, and so my first celebrity interview was Thor. And Thor said to me, well, I 
I really looked to the conductors of the, of the distant past for inspiration. And I remember Thor saying to me, I was um, doing food service and I was throwing a load of Brussels sprouts into the food line and Thor came to me and he says, Brian, Brian, do you have Kusevitsky's recording of Debussy's La Mer? And of course <laughs> this was very important because we were performing La Mer on tour. And I said, no, I don't. Uh, he says, you should get it immediately. Well, <laughs> two years later, I, I picked it up at a, the 78s at a junk music shop at, you know, for 25 cents a disc. And that and many other Kusevitsky recordings changed my life. And uh, knowing what a tremendous influence uh, Kusevitsky had on this orchestra and what he did with the Boston Symphony and the influence that he had going forward with um, composers like uh, Aaron Copland and uh, or many, many others. It's just incalculable. And there's a part of me that wants to impress upon everybody what he did and his influence uh, that is a very part of uh, what I did. And when I started doing the Boston Symphony broadcast in 1991, oh, Kusevitsky was never far from my script writing or music uh, usage. And our audience will hear a wonderful seven minute clip of Kusevitsky's voice today. Many of you have never heard Kusevitsky's voice and uh, what, what an incredible historical uh, tape that is. Actually, I just recently found out that, of course, you know, uh, he retired from the Boston Symphony Orchestra as music director in 1949. But in 1950, all of his music library was given to Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And he, he really had a, a huge connection with the state of Israel. Yes, I mean, uh, and one cannot underestimate the importance of his tour with the Israel Philharmonic in 1950. Uh, he, yes, Toscanini conducted in 1937 when it was the Palestine Symphony, but his tour in 1950, uh, I think was incalculable for the establishment of the orchestra as a major cultural uh, entity in the world. Uh, I remember Marty Bookspan telling me that he was absolutely awed that many of the people there, the, the common people, whether it was the, the local cab driver or the grocery clerk would stop him in the street and say, Dr. Kusevitsky, and of course, you know, he was referred to doctor because of, as, of his honorary doctorates. I understand that in the second measure of the first, first movement, you played the ritardando. Why is it that you did that? And uh, it, it impressed Kusevitsky greatly, and, and he was really uh, thrilled to have had that impact upon the orchestra. He could have taken the limo to and from his home in Jamaica Plain, but he took the, e, the subway E-train to <laughs> and from concerts. And so he talked and engaged with many of the uh, concert going listeners, um, uh, especially after the Friday afternoon concerts. And I can't think of anybody doing that in this day and age. I, I often imagine him coming down with his procession from Saranac, his summer home uh, in ta at Tanglewood and uh, the procession with his cape and the uh, Stockbridge local policeman and the horns that tooted. He had a special horn on his car, which was, I believe, a triad uh, all played together and uh, the, the pomp and circumstance. But also for uh, our viewers who may not know, uh, Kusevitsky is buried at the top of the church on the hill right here in Lenox between wives number two and three. He enjoys that position. So uh, you're, I, visited him, I visit him every single year and uh, certainly he is one of my heroes as, as well. Was he one of your favorite conductors? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I, by the time I graduated from college, I had two thirds of his discography on 78s, which 
you, you know, was probably about 120 pounds worth of shellac discs. Uh, and so you, he, uh, he was a, a, a tremendous musical influence uh, upon me, along with, um, you know, others of that period. And so he, his recordings influenced me, and it's kind of the lens in which I, I judge even today uh, performances. And so at some point in your career, I know you were part of the Cincinnati Symphony, no, the Columbus, Ohio Symphony. Uh, tell us about that chapter in your life. Okay, well, <laughs> the, the funny thing was after, you know, my interview with Thor, Thor died uh, my senior year at high school, and I ended up getting um, uh, a major award from National Public Radio for that interview. And on the basis of that, I, uh, my freshman year at Eastman, I was, uh, <laughs> I was a uh, producer of music from Eastman, which was a syndicated uh, radio broadcast, hour long radio broadcast of performances. By some miracle, my horn playing was good enough that I auditioned and got the job of second horn of the Columbus, Ohio Symphony Orchestra uh, in 1979. And so for six years, um, I, I played there at, it was a per service orchestra at that time. It was not anywhere close to being a living wage. And so I had to supplant it with other jobs. And so I taught at Wright State University, um, teaching horn. I was what, 22 teaching, uh, at that point in time. And also I worked at WOSU in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, all those jobs barely got me to five figures annually. So uh, with, with that in 1985, I decided that I couldn't get more than $12 an hour teaching at Wright State University. And so any kind of teaching I was gonna be able to supplant along with playing, I had to get a graduate degree. So I decided to come to Boston and uh, attend New England Conservatory uh, in a master's degree. So with that, I freelanced in the Boston area and uh, uh, studied with uh, Charles Kowalowski, who was the principal horn of the Boston Symphony at that time. And I've been here ever since. And at some point you landed at WGBH. Yes, well, um, when I was at WXXI in Rochester, New York, the person who was assistant general manager was Brad Spear, who later became general manager of WGBH. And so knowing that it was a calculated risk to come to Boston. And uh, when I got to Boston, uh, they put me to work translating um, tapes of the Salzburg Festival the, with German announcements uh, for use. Uh, they had a program called the International Music Series where they took concerts from Salzburg and Bavaria and, and other places and that had German announcements. And so I would translate them into English for the uh, announcer to read over. The other program that I was involved with starting in 1986 was the Vienna New Year's Day concert uh, every January 1st. And oh gosh, within six years, I ended up producing that and I've been involved with that since so from 1986, and I was producer last year, uh, do the math, <laughs> it's been a while. So um, yeah, so, uh, and the ironic thing is that uh, WGBH stopped producing that program in 2015. And so there were a lot of us, uh, former WGBHers, who ended up producing the program in the basement of Symphony Hall. Um, and so we do it for, uh, for NPR. And so here it was, Andres Nelson was the last conductor of the New Year's Day. Uh, so I did an interview with him, it ended up being in the, um, in the program. And uh, the interview, the sit down interview I did with Andres for New Year's Day uh, ended up being shared by all the stations of the uh, European Broadcast Union, which was a lot of fun. So you just like Marty, I've done many, many interviews over your, your career, which still continue. <laughs> Marty's done well over a thousand. Uh, who have some, who have been your favorite people to interview? Uh, well, Marty's one. Uh, 
Uh, I love interviewing uh, Marty because he's got more stories than I have by a long shot. Um, I would say of the people over the years, uh, Sir Colin Davis, uh, especially when he came back, Bennett Heiting, um, one of the trials by fires that I did uh, that I was lucky that I got a chance to talk to him was Eric Leinsdorf. Uh, and so there was an early part. Uh, but Colin Davis, really, the humanity of the man, uh, and also Bennett Heitink, uh, were just uh, wonderful. You have a guest coming up in a couple of weeks uh, that I always enjoy talking to uh, with Stefan Deneuve. And so I'm uh, looking forward to uh, having him come back um, sometime soon because there's a lot going on upstairs in, in, that, uh, in that head of Stefan Deneuve's. And so he was always a very engaging conversationalist. Stefan is one of my very favorite people and one of my favorite conductors. And we may just have a special surprise a little bit later in this broadcast from Stefan. But talking about broadcasts, you've brought us some really fantastic uh, snippets uh, of your own archives. Uh, would you like to start and... Uh, well, you know, I think before we go too much further, we need to acknowledge that uh, there is a significant birthday. And I think we need to talk about um, Martin Bookspan, who, as was acknowledged, is the greatest classical music announcer of the 20th century. There's just, it, it, in my book, it doesn't even come, nobody else comes close. Um, he, um, he grew up in Boston. Uh, he met Kusevitsky starting in 1944. He uh, interviewed Kusevitsky, which we'll hear a little bit of tape of, of his. Uh, he knew Leonard Bernstein. Uh, oh my gosh, he was there when Leonard Bernstein conducted his first concert at the Esplanade, uh, conducting the Boston Pops in uh, 1939 and was not there for Lenny's last concert in 1990, but was there for the penultimate concert with the Tanglewood Music Center of the Copeland Third Symphony. Host of the New York Philharmonic, host of Live at Lincoln Center. For 30 uh, years. For 30 years. He, but that doesn't even begin. He is a, just an astonishing wealth of knowledge about not only music, but um, I'm a baseball fan. And he basically leaves me in the dust uh, uh, in terms of what he knows about baseball. It's astonishing. It's astonishing what he knows and um, just his just his knowledge of what you know most people would consider arcane is at his fingertips, and it just is such an important um, aspect. So I, I hope you will uh, allow me to just take a few minutes and read uh, a little bit of his uh, bio and career to uh, those of our viewers who may not be as familiar with our beloved Marty Bookspan, who, by the way, is listening today from his home in Aventura, Florida. Marty Bookspan, born 94 years today is an announcer, a commentator, author, and much more. Starting in the late 1950s as the voice of the Boston Symphony Orchestra and then the New York Philharmonic and with stints on National Public Radio and WQXR, Marty was already a mainstay in the arts when John Goberman, the executive producer of Live from Lincoln Center, tapped him for a job in 1976. Marty was the obvious person to do it, Mr. Goberman said. No one knows more than Marty. No one is more identifiable. And that's very important for the series. He's almost like a trademark. Zubin Mehta has recently referred to him as the sitting encyclopedia. As you mentioned, uh, Marty was reared in Boston or near Boston in a home that resounded with cantorial music and Yiddish and Russian folk songs in his parents' glorious voices. And then, of course, there was always the radio. 
He did attend Harvard University, majoring in German literature. And in 1944, at the age of 18, first broadcast on the college's radio station, WHRB. He sat in front of a live microphone for the very first time and spoke fluidly for 45 minutes with Aaron Copeland, unearthing a nugget that Copeland was considering a work for Martha Graham. That work was, of course, Appalachian Spring, and perhaps the very first mention of it anywhere. At 13, with his musical knowledge already formidable, he earned an honorary mention in the music quiz competition sponsored by the Boston Herald and the Boston Pops. One of first two place winners was an aspiring conductor named Leonard Bernstein. It was the start of a 50 year friendship. And as you and I discussed, Brian, Marty is probably the last living link between Leonard Bernstein, Aaron Copeland and Serge Kusevitsky, all of whom he had decades and decades of friendships with. He spent 10 years at the radio station WQXR in New York, where he was music director and program director. He was the director of recorded music at ASCAP. He also authored several books, including the biography of Zubin Mehta and, as you see, Andre Previn. In 2006, Marty was inducted into the American Classical Music Hall of Fame in Cincinnati. I believe he's the only broadcaster to have done so. He also holds honorary doctorates from several colleges, including one from the Manhattan School of Music. For those of you who think you know all about Tanglewood, I would encourage you to visit the two seats at section four, row J, seat one and two. You will see an honorary plaque which simply says, Martin Bookspan, the voice of classical music. And that is just a tiny tidbit of our beloved Marty, who today we wish you happy birthday and many more to come. Uh, Brian, would you like to play the first of your snippets? I think it's very exciting for our audience to hear it. Yes, this is actually a birthday greeting uh, for Marty Bookspan. And uh, it dates from, I think, 1994, uh, 1994, as best I can ascertain. Can't hear it, Brian. Brian, there's no audio. Brian, we need to have it louder. Let's try again. So this is uh, Richard L. K. speaking with Andre Previn. Brian, can we have it louder, do you think? Can you turn it up? Be sure, Brian, to um, check the com use computer sound box because that will make sure that it only takes the sound directly from the computer and it will be a, a lot better. Okay, that was uh, full volume. <laughs> um, so yes, that's Marty. Uh, uh, that's Andre Previn wishing Marty Bookspan a happy birthday. Okay, uh, shall we go on to the next one? Uh, yes, it would be wonderful. And if we can somehow turn up the volume, that would even be better. I'm, I'm up full blast here. So. Uh, okay. It's very, very important that you click on the use computer sound button when you do the, the share screen. Uh, that will make a huge difference. So it, it's possible you didn't do it the first time. I'm not sure. 
Got it. Okay. okay. Perfect. Thank you. So let's talk about Leonard Bernstein. Now, many people, uh, and I think there's with some justification, credit Leonard Bernstein for uh, bringing the, um, the music of Gustav Mahler to central to the uh, repertoire of American orchestral repertoire. Um, the truth is a little bit different in that the New York premiere of the Mahler Ninth Symphony was conducted by Serge Kuzovitsky in the Boston Symphony. And in fact, Kuzovitsky in the Boston Symphony in New York performed the Mahler Ninth on November 19th, 1931, January 9th, 1932, April 2nd, 1936, March 13th, 1941, before the New York Philharmonic and Bruno Walter did the New York uh, Mahler Ninth Symphony in 1945 in two performances. But uh, the upshot of it is, is that the Boston Symphony gave more performances of the Mahler Ninth Symphony than the New York Philharmonic did until 1965. So this is a seemingly arcane bit of um, information. Um, but when Marty had Bernstein's last interview uh, in 1989, he ended up correcting Leonard Bernstein. So let's see if I can get this. Aha, here we go. And try this. I didn't hear much Mahler other than that because Kusevitsky didn't play very much. He oh, played the, the Adagetta for the Fifth Symphony. He would play the two Nachtmusiken from the Seventh Symphony. Do you know that he did the American premiere of the Ninth? Kusevitsky no, did no, Amer no, yes, no, that's yes, not possible. Yes, indeed. 1932. He's not given credit for the kind Why of Why don't Mahler. I know that? I guess it's Why are you up? embarrassing me on air in front of all these people? I mean, Kuzovitsky was my best friend for one whole decade, the yes. last decade of his life. Mm -hmm. And we talked about Mahler a lot. He was present when I did the Resurrection Symphony with the uh, Boston, Boston Symphony. Symphony. And of course, I did it after he died in his memory. Yes. He also, as a matter of fact, had scheduled, it never came off, but he had scheduled the American premiere of the sixth in the mid 1930s. Then there were some problems with scores and it just never happened. Hmm. No, you really amaze me with this information about the ninth. I know that Bruno Walter was the only conductor who knew it, having given the, um, the world premiere in Vienna. But uh, it was a disaster, that world premiere. And he was so frightened of it that after he left Vienna and came to this country, he didn't perform it uh, for decades. Mm. The things I am learning on this program. <laughs> and really, I can't get over Kuzovitsky conducting the ninth. But that's in indeed what happened. Marty had a really special relationship with Lenny. He referred to him as a true genius. And uh, I've never heard Marty speak about anyone in that way, but uh, certainly uh, he came as close as to be genius as anyone could possibly. And they had a special relationship. And he has a special relationship with Bernstein's kids as well. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Um, this next clip, uh, I actually had Marty on the Boston Symphony broadcast for his 80th birthday, as well as his 85th birthday, as well as his 90th birthday, or not his 99, but his 80th and his 85th birthday um, at, at Tanglewood. And as part of his 80th, I had a sit down uh, conversation. And so from 2006, we talk about one of the great disasters uh, in Boston Symphony history. This is 
April 1959, and I will let Marty explain what exactly happened. Bear with me. I want to make sure I do it right this time. Oh, yeah, there we go. Can you tell me about the tape that you wish you have but don't. Charles Munch is conducting. You are up at Symphony Hall and Rudolf Serkin is at the piano. What happens? Well, I'll backtrack a little. That was a concert in April of 1959. Munch, music director, but the first half of that concert was conducted by Aaron Copeland. Hmm. Appalachian Spring and a Suite from Tenderland. The following Monday they recorded those two pieces. So that was in the first half of the concert, Sirkin and Munch in the Brahms B-flat in the second half. I did an unforgivable thing. I introduced the second half of the concert. This is live, of course. Then I left my perch in the broadcast booth, which was stage right in Symphony Hall, second balcony level. And I went downstairs to the stage level and across the backstage to where Copeland was, and there were certain things that I wanted to discuss with Copeland. About 20 minutes later, the stage door directly opposite our site opened up, and one of the bass players in the orchestra, Tiny Martin, called Tiny because he was enormous, right. Tiny walks off stage holding his bass, and there's no music coming from the stage. Well, obviously, I tore across the backstage, up the two flights of steps, got back to the broadcast booth, and en route picked up the information that there was a problem with the piano. Well, I got to the microphone, huffed and puffed, and said, as soon as I catch my breath, I'll keep you apprised of what's going on. So when I caught my breath, I talked about Brahms and the BSO, the fact that when Symphony Hall was opened, one critic said, for the exit signs, they should say, exit in case of Brahms. Munch and the BSO, Munch and Brahms, French musicians and Brahms, because Brahms wasn't really that well liked by French musicians. Anything that came to mind for 18 minutes. Eventually, the only way that, the, oh, what had happened was that in his physical pounding of both hands and feet, Serkin had torn the lyre mechanism away from the piano, so the piano was unplayable. And during this 18 minutes or so, Munch walked around and around the podium. Serkin sat at the keyboard, his head bowed. And they finally were able to get the piano playable by wedging a two by four under the lyre, propping it back in place, and the concerto continued. However, this episode had happened at the start of the slow movement. And as you know, the slow movement begins with a cello solo. The cellist of the BSO at the time was Sammy Mays. Mm. Nothing phased Sammy, mm. except for that solo. So he had played the solo, and there was no entrance of the piano the first time. Obviously, the thing to do when the piano was back in, in harness was to start the movement again. So Sammy had to play that solo again. He came off the stage a nervous wreck. <laughs> <laughs> the famous thing about that uh, whole event was the speech that Munch gave, the piano, she is broke. Right. <laughs> and I think that was probably the only time of maybe two or three times where he actually spoke to the audience at Symphony Hall. Amazing, amazing. And... Uh... Marty is still looking for a tape uh, that may survive of the 18 minutes, but uh, it has not shown up. So. If any of you have it out there, please send it our way. Brian, has anything like that ever happened to you during your career? Have you had any moments where you, you were really terrified that something went wrong? Um. I've been very lucky in that regard. Uh, I mean, we had power outages uh, a couple times where the broadcast just ended a little early, shall we say. Um, there was not too much 
Um, I think my favorite story had to do with Tanglewood, and I, I want to say it occurred 2005. And I, I was not producing. Luis de la Fuente was, was producing the broadcast. I had done the intermission feature back then. Brad Spear was the host. And the concert was, um, Hans Graf was conducting, and the Tchaikovsky Pathetic Symphony was about to start. And you have those open fifths and the low strings before the bassoon st solo starts. Somebody had programmed the sprinklers on the Tanglewood lawn. Instead of going off at 10 a.m., they went off at 10 p.m. So just before the solo, you heard all this screaming and people yelling because the sprinklers on the lawn had all gone off all at the same time. And so the, the audience was, was there. And Graf, of course, I had to interview him about this the following year, uh, realized that you, know, you just couldn't begin this symphony with, with all the screaming going on in the lawn. And so they stopped, they stopped the symphony two bars in. So backstage, I'm trying to find out what's going on. Brad Spears in, in the booth. And so he's sitting there kind of saying, uh, the concert is um, stopped. We don't know quite what, what is going on. So I was able to feed the information as I, I gathered it to Brad over the intercom um, as it was taking place. The one thing I will never forget is, um, Harry Shapiro was backstage. Now, who's Harry Shapiro? Harry Shapiro joined the Boston Symphony in 1937 as second horn. He was there for the thunderstorm uh, in which the, the tent was, was going to collapse. Eventually, he became personnel manager of the Boston Symphony uh, throughout the, the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And then towards the end of... Uh, his career was personnel manager of the Tanglewood Music Center. And he was practically in his 90s by this time. And so, of course, Harry was backstage. And Harry says, geez, Brian, I don't think anything like this has ever happened. And I said, Harry, if you don't think it's ever happened, it's never happened. <laughs> so, so that was it. Uh, there was a lot of... Um, Embarrassment, uh, they eventually did get the Tchaikovsky Pathetic performed, but um, uh, yes, that was uh, what you could consider a great disaster. Well, that's one of the reasons that I think we all love Tanglewood so much. Anything can happen from the birds to the skunks under the seats uh, to sprinklers. Uh, and uh, for those uh, who may not know, there is a plaque on the side of the shed dedicated to Gertrude Robinson Smith, who on that very night of August 5th, 1937, I believe, was it? No, August 12th? Hmm. August, August 12th. yes, I think it's August 12th, yes. Yeah, okay. It was a storm. Uh, the first concert that year was August 5th. And so the second week, it was the first concert of the second week, um, uh, 1937, that the thunderstorm, it was an all Wagner concert. An all uh, Wagner concert, which, and the, the rain pounded down on the structure, uh, just wiping out the concert, getting the instruments all wet. And Gertrude Robinson Smith walked on the stage in her, gown soaking wet and uh, asked the audience for contributions and that ra that night she raised thirty thousand dollars and uh, the rest is history the shed was built uh, by the within, a year. within a year and came in under budget at ninety thousand dollars so uh, lots of history there but um, for those of you who may not know uh, uh, tell tell us where the broadcast booth is located uh, in the shed. If you remember the audience, it's off to the left. Uh, so stage right, if you will. Um, there's kind of a quasi glass. Little triangular shaped window. Yep, mm -hmm. I actually uh, was in the booth as an announcer uh, for the first, I <laughs> perhaps only time for Tanglewood on Parade last, um, uh, last summer. Um, so I was produce, producer and host uh, for that broadcast, which will be heard on WAMC, I believe. Um, uh, yes, August 18th. 
Uh, oh, is that when it's going to be broadcast? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for all of you who would like to listen, the Tanglewood On Parade broadcast will begin this year on August 18th. Okay. Yeah. And that's, mm. there's going to be two different versions. One's home hosted by James Taylor. Mm -hmm. and that's a video one. I, that may be the one on August 18th. The radio mm -hmm. broadcast, I think, will be later. I could be wrong. Check the WAMC listings or WFCR listings for the radio broadcast, which may be a different entity. Um, uh, there's, there's several different versions going, going on here. So You know, you, you speak about uh, yourself as the producer. Can you explain to us what is the difference between a director and a producer? Oh, that can change by whoever's uh, <laughs> running things, if you will. As I see it, uh, the producer is the person who creates. Uh, so uh, when I'm producing, I write the script, I plan the broadcast as to what happens when. A director is pretty much an executor of that production. Um, so I would direct a show after I had written it uh, invariably for the 21 years of Boston Symphony broadcast that I did. Um, so, you know, I write the script that, that I and do the interviews, edit the interviews, select music that would go before and after. That I regard as a producer function. Somebody who is essentially directing traffic during the night of the broadcast or day of the broadcast is the director. Thank you, thank you. Um, your next clip is one of my very favorites. Would you introduce it to us? Yes, this is a real piece of history. There's very few surviving elements of Kuzovitsky speaking. One is the uh, NBC broadcast, August 4th, 1938, of the first night at the, sh of the shed where he announces why he's going to conduct the Beethoven Ninth Symphony. But a one-on-one -on -one sit down interview, there's practically nothing except the last of the three interviews that Martin Buxban did with um, Serge Kuzovitsky. So this I'm ascertaining, I believe is the fall of 1949. He had just returned from Brazil. And so uh, he tells Martin Buxban about his time in Brazil uh, and this clip is actually lifted from our conversation from 2006. And so um, we talk about this interview while listening to the interview uh, total. Bear with me. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Martin Buxpan speaking to you from the Brookline home of the conductor emeritus of the Boston Symphony Orchestra, Dr. Serge Kusevitsky. We of WBMS are very privileged in having this transcribed interview with Dr. Kusevitsky prior to his departure for his winter home in Arizona. There are so few interviews of Serge Kusevitsky. Why? That's a good question. And you floored me when you said, this one is only one of three. I don't understand why. As a matter of fact, I did three different Kusevitsky interviews. And is this the only one that you still have in your collection? That's correct, unfortunately. Although I like this one. <laughs> now to get down to your recent trip to Brazil, Dr. Kusevitsky, I've read with great interest the press reports about your concerts down there. Did you enjoy your stay in Rio and the other cities? It was extremely interesting. I find the Brazilian musical life in general uh, not in a very high state. And the orchestra is a, uh, perhaps less than a second order orchestra. Mm -hmm. So it was a hard work, but extremely a uh, successful work. The musicians have been uh, delighted to uh, have a conductor who worked with them. 
uh, because uh, can I talk a little longer? Absolutely, Dr. Kuznick. <laughs> no, this interview is strictly, uh, there is no time limit on it. We no. can talk for a half hour. <laughs> and what do you think about the public? <laughs> Why, they, they are think sure. they have patience? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and right. interest too? Absolutely, Dr. Kuznick. The floor is yours. Yeah. All right, then let's talk. <laughs> He's so personable. The reputation is something Formidable. of a... Formidable. You can't touch him. Not at all, or at least in terms of my relationship with him, which was almost like a great uncle and nephew. I first met him right after the Bartok Concerto for Orchestra premiere. I was an usher in the hall at the time, and we established something of a rapport. But three, four, five years later, we really came together. About Brazil, the musical life, I can, I can tell you many uh, things, but I will concentrate my, my little story. And um, I will tell you, uh, the, con the orchestra was conducted 10 years by a able man. And so really they have forgotten what is a artistical discipline. The played no nuances at all. Uh, they forget what is a quarter and what is a eight and <laughs> what is a sixteen. It was just the same for them. So it was a very hard work, but a very successful work. I stopped the whole concerts for a time, in spite of the um, protest <laughs> of the directors. I told them if you want to give the concerts when I will find that the orchestra is ready, then we will give concerts. If not, not. No concerts. <laughs> and the, the um, president from the orchestra, who is a admiral, who uh, certainly know, knows what, that four and four is <laughs> eight, <laughs> or two and two is four, so he, it was for him very uh, surprising to see an artist who come and said that there will be no concerts. When the tickets are sold out, <laughs> the public two months before have already this order of the concerts. But I hadn't accept simply to conduct otherwise. And this stopped. And when I made seven rehearsals and I saw that if I will have five more for the first concert, then we can have a concert. So I asked the, I asked the admiral and I told him, uh, in this and this day you can have your first concerts. And he did so. Mm -hmm. So after the last five rehearsals, in all 12 for the first con concert, and for a program, so known by any orchestra, I um, played the Beethoven's uh, Overture, Egmont, on the Seventh Symphony in the first, first half. First half. And the second half of Sibelius, the second symphony. It is a, a big program, but any orchestra knows. But still I need 12 rehearsals. 12 rehearsals to play well. Mm -hmm. To put the uh, recognizable Kusevitsky stamp on performances, I'm sure. That Not that absolutely. <laughs> well, <laughs> I know Dr. Kusevitsky that you are you know, continuing. We have the habit to the Boston <laughs> That's right. Funny. That's right. With the orchestra, but to my work 25 years. Mm -hmm. So this standard you cannot <laughs> <laughs> I can expect. imagine. But it was a good playing with a good tone, together, clean, and in tune. Mm -hmm. And the public, they have been absolutely surprised. They haven't believed that the own orchestra can play so well. And after the Seventh Symphony, they make me a tremendous salvation. Stood up and applaud and 
cheer and cry and the, the musicians, they told me later that we have never seen our public in such a enthusiasm. That's amazing. It's certainly a piece of history. Thank you so much. Yeah. You know, I'm reminded of the many commissions that Kusevitsky uh, did to bring to the Boston Symphony Orchestra that are now uh, part of the standard repertoire. Yeah, the 50th anniversary commissions, I mean, the Prokofiev Fourth, the Roussel Third, um, Stravinsky Symphony of Psalms, and then the Bartok Concerto for Orchestra. Uh, <laughs> my favorite story uh, regards Prokofiev. You know, Prokofiev was uh, in the Soviet Union, and he, re Kusevitsky received a letter from Prokofiev saying that there was a shortage of music paper for writing orchestral scores. And so Kusevitsky sent somebody down to Boston Music and said, get a, a bunch of reams of orchestral score paper so that we can send them to Prokofiev in the Soviet Union. So that they did. Uh, some 18 months later, uh, that score paper returned to Boston with the Prokofiev Fifth Symphony written on it. So if you look at the orchestral score, the manuscript orchestral score of the, of the Prokofiev Fifth Symphony, uh, look down in the corner, it says Boston Music Incorporated down in the lower corner. And that's why. I mean, think about that. That's, it, to me, it just, I just get chills thinking about, you know, this sort of help to composers to help create, you know, great music that we know and enjoy now. Didn't he also, uh, there's a story with the Bartok Concerto for Orchestra, I, I believe, where um, Bartok was quite ill and Kusevitsky paid him, I think, the sum of $500 to begin a composition and uh, he did and it, he, he really uh, brought him back to life in, in doing so. And of course, now we have the Bartok Concerto for Orchestra. So many, many, many stories. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, um, there's uh, going to um, Benjamin Britten, why you no write opera? <laughs> it's never an opportunity. It's just, you write, I conduct. And of course, the, the Kusevitsky Commission was this minor opera by Britain called Peter Grimes. I mean, it just, goes, it just goes on and on. As Copeland once said, I cannot imagine American music without him. There it is, a Russian you know, conductor. And the, the stacks upon stacks of music that uh, commissioned during his lifetime and also the, uh, the Kusevitsky Music Foundation since then have... Uh, just generated an, a, a tremendous amount so that there is a, a, a great American music tradition, which if I may get on a soapbox very briefly, um, is a, a, something that really has not been utilized to the extent that it could be. Hmm. There's some great music that's not being played to the extent it should be. He had a very interesting and uh loving relationship with Leonard Bernstein, although I understand he discouraged Bernstein from writing um, classic, uh, rather uh, musical theater pieces and, uh, and jazz. He, he had a hard time uh, uh, listening to, to jazz. Marty told me the story, and you'll forgive me, maybe you can, you can help remind me when uh, Bernstein wrote a particular symphony and there was a bit of jazz in the middle of it and uh, Kusevitsky listened to it and said, Hmm. It is it is jazz, but it is a noble jazz. <laughs> it the work in question is the Age of Anxiety Thank Symphony, you, Symphony number Symphony number two, and uh, Kusevitsky had a devil of a time with the scherzo, and he wanted Bernstein to take it out, uh, just to make life easier for Kusevitsky perhaps. But by the time the world premiere took place in uh, 1949 in April. Uh, Kusevitsky learned to love it. Uh, and then he, Bernstein conducted the New York premiere with Lucas Foss was the pianist uh, and Bernstein conducted. But uh, I think uh, that world premiere was the only time Bernstein was at the piano. So yes, Thank a you, noble jazz. Yeah. Mm -hmm. noble jazz. Uh, Brian, we, we do have some wonderful slides 
Uh, I don't remember if you have another clip or not. One more if you want to hear it. Oh, good. Sure, of course. Um, of course, uh, Arthur Fiedler it was a tremendous influence on Boston musical life, uh, just not only because of the pops, but he conducted concerts uh, at the Esplanade, uh, full length concerts with the, with the uh, Boston Symphony. Some of those concerts in mid forties were broadcast live on NBC. Uh, I actually um, uh, heard a Boston Symphony uh, Esplanade concert from 1944 and it's jaw dropping good. Anyhow, it was Fiedler who gave uh, Bernstein his start at the Esplanade with, uh, with the opportunity to conduct the uh, Brahms Academic Festival. And so Fiedler, along with Gusevitsky, was really a major, major force. So when I talked to Marty for his 90th birthday 40 years ago, or four years ago, um, I asked him about Arthur Fiedler, and this was the story that he came up with. Arthur Fiedler, by all indications, his tenure with the Pops 50 years in length was a roaring success. You got to know him. Yeah. I'm going to go to a story before I knew him, the story of our first meeting. Along with the Pops in those years were nightly concerts on the Esplanade by the Boston Pops, with the exception, I think, of Monday night. Anyway, it was there that Fiedler was able to indulge his great frustration. He conducted symphonic repertory, Brahms Beethoven symphonies, symphonies Brahms symphonies, yep. and so forth. This is when I was a pledge for the Harvard College radio station. I'm at an Esplanade concert after which I seek out Fiedler and represent myself as belonging to the Harvard Crimson Network. Would he come on the air with me? We would talk about his life and times. He said, sure, with one absolute necessity. What's that? That you have a six pack waiting for me. <laughs> we had the six pack, he came, we did our conversation. At one point, I said to him, Mr. Fiedler, to those of us out front, it looks as though you and the players are having fun. His response was, yes, we do have fun, but we try not to make it obvious. <laughs> now, this was in the days before wire recording, before tape, of course, this was Acetate disc. Acetate disc, 16 yep. inch acetate disc. So the conversation was recorded on an acetate disc and we played it back oh, a week later, maybe. We come to the point where I say, Mr. Fiedler, to those of us out front, it looks as though you and the players are having fun. Yes, we do have fun. We do have fun. We do have fun, we do have fun, but we try not to make it obvious. <laughs> that momentous moment for the needle to get stuck, stuck. in the groove right. was God sent. <laughs> oh, what a story. <laughs> Just visualizing the story makes me smile. Mm. Really funny, really funny. Yeah. Brian, this has just been such an incredible treat speaking with you. And we do have a number of slides which uh, we will talk about and uh, uh, show our audience. Let's take a look. And uh, here is one of Marty's headshots. Would you like to talk about this? 
Um, yes. I, I mean, I believe this is uh, from the mid 50s and that's Martin Buxban. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I think from 1951. Yeah, yeah, okay. exactly. Uh, next slide, please. That is the first WBMS interview. So, uh, which would be, I think, 1947. And uh, so Martin is 21 years old. Kusevitsky, of course, is off to the left there. Um, and uh, yes, in a perfect example, I mean, Kusevitsky was a, a great dresser. Um, and uh, what a personality. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, if one is lucky enough to visit Saranac, you can look into his armoire on the second floor and view his tuxedos, uh, which were made by a Parisian tailor in a very certain way. And I think we may know that um, Leonard Bernstein wore uh, Cousy's white tuxedo on his wedding day to Felicia. Uh, uh, next slide, please. That's uh, Martin Buxband with Charles Munch, the conductor of the Boston Symphony from 1949 to 1962. Um, during this time, uh, Marty was uh, the host of the Boston Symphony broadcasts along with William Pierce and others. There was one point um, that there were three separate live broadcast productions of the same concert coming out of Symphony Hall. Um, and Marty was with uh, QXR. Uh, there was the Boston Symphony Transcription Trust. There was NBC. Uh, I th it's so confusing to me, um, but I believe there was one or two seasons where there were concurrent uh, broadcast productions uh, every Saturday night at Symphony Hall. Thank you. Next slide, please. There he is at WQXR uh, in the early 60s. Where he served for 10 years as program director and music director. Did I get that right? I hope so. Yes. and you. You, I mean, it's, he was also host soon of the New York Philharmonic, if not the Boston Symphony. He was writing a tremendous amount. He, was, he had full-length biographies of, of Andre Previn and Zubin Mega. He was doing constantly, he was doing scores upon scores of, of record reviews uh, and uh, blurbs on the back of record jackets. Uh, his writing was a, an astonishing uh, and even from the very earliest days, uh, there was a High Fidelity article uh, from 1955 uh, that survives extremely well, uh, talking about the first recordings of the Boston Symphony. Uh, he actually wrote to uh, Arthur Fiedler, who was there at the sessions, uh, uh, asking him if he had any details of that. A very read readable 1955 article in High Fidelity that stands up to this day. And he's still writing, by the oh. way. He's still writing. Uh, next slide, please. There he is on the right is Isaac Stern, one of the great violinists of the 20th century, who is uh, 100 years old this year. Uh, Isaac Stern also, uh, he <laughs> saved Carnegie Hall. There's probably no other term will do. And also was instrumental in developing the careers of many an, or, uh, a, a soloist. Uh, in the 20th century. Isaac Stern, as you may know, is featured uh, very prominently uh, on the Tanglewood Online Festival, celebrating his 100th birthday. And it's often said that he played two instruments, the violin and the telephone, because of his uh, great, great abilities to connect with people, with heads of state. And of course, uh, in uh, Saving Carnegie Hall, we are, we are so fortunate to, to have his dedication to, to that, to that beautiful hall. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, well, we know who's on the left there. That's Leonard Bernstein. And uh, uh, forgive me if I've already said this, to, this today, but Marty was at Lenny's first concert on the Esplanade in 1939 uh, and was there for his penultimate concert in 1990. So he, knew and was friends with Bernstein for 50 years throughout the entirety of his, of Bernstein's conducting career. 
No more need be said. <laughs> Thank you. That says it all. Uh, next slide, please. On the right is Michael Tilson Thomas. Uh, and uh, you know, Renee, that he, uh, that Marty and MTT are in uh, close contact some 50 years later. Of course, like Leonard Bernstein and his New York Philharmonic debut, uh, Michael Tilson Thomas had a last minute, mid concert, in fact, uh, debut with the Boston Symphony at Carnegie Hall when um, Steinberg conducted uh, the initial overture and came off stage and ordered Michael Tilson Thomas on stage to continue the Boston Symphony concert in the fall of 1969. Marty also um, was the host of a program called The Eternal Light, uh, where he interviewed uh, Michael Tilson Thomas and his father uh, about the Tomaszewskis, uh, which is uh, a wonderful uh, show produced a number of years ago at Tanglewood, all about the history of the Tomaszewski family. Uh, next slide, please. Off to the right is the current artistic um, uh, administrator of the Boston Symphony. He's been in that position since 1995, Anthony Fogg. Um, and it, you probably know Renee better than I do the uh, history behind this photograph. Well, this is, I believe, Marty's 90th birthday celebration and he's being interviewed by Tony Fogg during uh, talks and walks at Tanglewood. The, I, I remember Tony saying to me, or to saying to everyone, I'm interviewing the interviewer. And that's somewhat like I feel today, Brian. Oh, shucks. <laughs> Next slide, please. Oh, we all know who's on the left there. Uh, I think, and don't we have another photograph? Uh, yes, there we go. Now, um, yes, that's Yo-Yo Ma on the right there. Uh, t I don't know if you can see the hat that Marty is wearing, I believe that's his Red Sox hat. And the Red Sox is in Hebrew. Uh, like I said, he is a baseball fan, sine qua non, uh, and a Red Sox fan, you know, going, you, yeah, I mean, everybody thinks Martin Book's band, New York, he, well, he's gotta be a Yankees fan. No, 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 <laughs> great secret. I mean, and he knows his baseball. He really does. Uh, I, I'm I, I really love this picture because Yo-Yo is kneeling on the shed stage in order to embrace his friend Marty. And you touched upon something really interesting, Brian. Uh, I'd like to read a quote from Marty. Uh, basically, he said, I, if I have the technique, it's the technique of a sportscaster, Mr. Booksband said. As a sportscasters make the game come alive, I hope I have made concerts come alive. I want the audience to become involved, to love what they're hearing. And we are so grateful for uh, having the privilege of uh, Marty having brought uh, his love of music into our homes and into our lives. Uh, thank you from the tens of thousands of viewers of Live from Lincoln Center, Marty, uh, we wish you a very, very happy birthday and uh, all good things always. Uh, we do have uh, a special uh, video, which I'd uh, like to uh, uh, show you before we wrap up, Brian. It's from uh, Stefan Denev, all the way from Brussels. Dear Marty, bonjour. We hope that you are doing great on your special day and we wish we could be with you in the beautiful forests of the Berkshires. But close enough, we are speaking to you from the beautiful forest as well of Belgium. We are surrounded by magnificent trees. Some of them are certainly the same age as you. They saw many springs and they will enjoy many more springs to come like you. So, Osa and I, Love you and wish you a happy birthday. Happy birthday. Uh, that's uh, Osa, uh, uh, Stefan's wife, and we will be speaking with Stefan uh, in August, a little bit later. Uh, before we turn it over to Megan, 
Wilden for some Q&A. Brian, I want to thank you so very, very much for joining me this morning. It's just been an absolute pleasure. And uh, we wish you all the very best for your continuing success in your broadcasting career and hope we see you back at Tanglewood very, very soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. What a wonderful conversation and what a terrific tribute to Marty Bookspan on the Bookspan on the occasion of his 94th birthday. I'm so glad he's here to see it. And that video, Mr. Fawn, was just wonderful. So uh, we have a couple of questions from uh, Francis. Uh, the first one is, did Kusevitsky ever work with Rachmaninoff, Galels, I may not be saying that right, or Richter? Um, uh, certainly Rachmaninoff. Um, there are, if you look at the annals of the um, Boston Symphony, there are instances of when uh, Rachmaninoff was the piano soloist and Kusevitsky conducted. Uh, Rachmaninoff's ultimate loyalty was with the Philadelphia Orchestra. And so any recordings that Rachmaninoff made as conductor are with Philadelphia and uh, uh, concerto appearances. I find it interesting that um, Kusevitsky made no recordings of Rachmaninoff until after Rachmaninoff died. However, once uh, Rachmaninoff passed away in 1943, he made an absolutely unbelievable recording of the Isle of the Dead uh, in April of 1945, uh, literally a week after uh, Franklin Roosevelt died and just two or three days after word had come out of the, the atrocities of Buchenwald. And so to record the Isle of the Dead, I think, um, at that moment in time in April 1945, uh, I think made for one of Kusevitsky's great recordings. Um, but uh, really Rachmaninoff's affinity was with, um, was with uh, Philadelphia. Now, Richter. Richter did not come um, to the United States until 1960, which was, um, a decade after uh, Kusevitsky passed away. He did come to uh, Chicago, uh, I think in 1956, but he also recorded the Beethoven first piano concerto with the Boston Symphony uh, on a Charles Munch in December of 1960. Gilles, uh did not come, uh, he was in Chicago in the um, 1950s, he never made it to Boston until much later. I think he uh, was in New York around that time. Uh, Richter, of course, gave uh, a pair of very famous recitals in December of 1960. Uh, but no, uh, Gilles and Richter's paths unfortunately never crossed. Thank you. And uh, follow up question, what did Kusevitsky think of Toscanini? Oh, ha, ha, ha. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of funny. I think there was, there was a lot of uh, mutual respect, but the, um, the competition, if you will, for lack of a better word, between Toscanini, Toscanini never conducted in Boston, um, for example. Uh, and even though Kusevitsky um, didn't want to invite to, uh, Toscanini. The, the board really wanted Toscanini to show up in 1947 for, um, uh, for uh, Toscanini's 80th birthday. Um, so there was a very healthy rivalry. But can you imagine uh, 1934, for example, Stokowski was in Philadelphia, Toscanini was in New York, the music director of the New York Philharmonic, and Kusevitsky is music director of the Boston Symphony. Um, there is a very, shall we say, healthy respect for each other's um, art, but uh, yes, it was kind of a strong rivalry. I will say this too, is that uh, I don't think I'm very unique in that I can immediately tell a Stokowski Philadelphia recording from a Toscanini New York Phil recording from a Kusevitsky Boston Symphony recording, the orchestras sounded different and it was an immediately a different sound. There was not this kind of 
uh, each orchestra had a distinctive sound uh, that you could tell. There's kind of a, a sameness uh, uh, that goes from orchestra to orchestra, even from uh, country to country in this day and age. It wasn't that way. Um, for lack of, um, for lack of a better term, that they, uh, Kusevitsky was there 22 out of the 24 subscription weeks. And so it really was his orchestra and really an extension of his personality. And that was certainly true of, of Stokowski in Philadelphia and certainly true of um, Tuscanini in New York when he was there, even though we only have a handful of Tuscanini New York film recordings. And Brian, I, I am in awe that you can tell the difference between one orchestra and another orchestra, possibly who's conducting one orchestra or another. Would you tell our audience what you feel the difference in sound is between perhaps uh, European orchestras and American orchestras? Again, it's really, there's kind of a homogeneity of, of sound that you can't tell London from Paris from uh, Cleveland. Um, back then, um, Philadelphia, uh, with Stokowski was basically they built, uh, Stokowski was an organist and he built the string sound from the bottom up so that if the cellos and the violins were in octaves, you heard far more cello than violin. You don't drown out the violins as a result. You just make the string sound sound much, much bigger. Also, uh, Sikulski instituted free bowing. And so the line was just kind of this beautiful, you know, long soup uh, of, of line. Um, Kusevitsky really was a double bass player. And so he also um, built the orchestra from the bottom up, but he was really much more interested in energy and clarity um, than Stokowski was. Toscanini was almost the opposite in that he was very much a uh, precisionist and the uh, beauty of sound was not really all that important to him. And so that is one thing that you can uh, distinguish. Let's, uh, one orchestra that still has something resembling a a unique characteristic, well, the Czech Philharmonic, but Vienna, um, you look at their horns and you look at their trumpets, they use rotary valve trumpets rather than piston trumpets that we have commonly in, in the United States. Um, the, the timpani, uh, the timpani will be seated and the, and the heads will be angled towards them and they will play towards the center of the head. Um, those are a couple of the characteristics um, but with the Czech Philharmonic, they um, basically had their own woodwinds and, and brass instruments that created their unique sound. And also that they had their own schools of playing their own conservatories that fostered that, um, that kind of sound. That was going on with the Curtis Institute throughout the 50s and 60s in Philadelphia the Cleveland Institute of Music with Cleveland uh, to, to a lesser extent. And uh, now that uh, the American orchestras are sounding more and more alike uh, due to uh, the cross uh, pollination, if you, uh, if you will. I will say this about the Boston Symphony is that to this day, very few orchestras in the world can play French music like they can. Uh, just the subtlety of, of sound of, of Debussy and Ravel um, is just utterly unique. You, you hear other major American orchestras and they just, they just don't have the reserve and the, the polish uh, and almost the austerity of, of gesture that uh, Boston does so naturally. Wow, thank you so much. That's so impressive. Well, so we have, <laughs> it's I mean, beautiful, it's a beautiful thing. These are just my personal impressions. I'm sure if there was somebody else, they would you know, rabidly disagree with me. And this is what, um, it, you know, it's like talking baseball, if you will. 
um, that uh, uh, other people would, would, you know, dramatically and radically disagree with me, but those are my personal impressions of, of sure. what I hear. Okay. Absolutely. So um, um, an attendee named Sarah Gilbert says, bravo, Freddie. So very, and so very informative and joy and a great treat to wake up to this morning and best wishes for a very happy and healthy birthday, Marty. And then she has a question. What does Marty think of Gustavo D? Oh, Gustavo Dudamel. Well, we know, Sarah, how much you love Gustavo Dudamel. I think Marty is very open to the future of classical music. And I think he's very excited that Gustavo Dudamel has really set Los Angeles on fire. Uh, what he has accomplished coming out of El Sistema has been nothing short of miraculous. And um, I, I think uh, Gustavo Dudamel has really uh, ignited the classical music world with his enthusiasm and, and his passion. Brian, how would you answer that question? I, I think that's a very good assessment. I Here's one thing is that there's nothing wrong with classical music. There's nothing wrong with Mozart. There's nothing wrong with Beethoven, Brahms, uh, Schumann. People are saying that classical music is, is dying. I submit to you that sometimes it's, uh, it may be an over reverence that, that we're having and, and not letting the music come alive uh, that it, or keep treating with it an over sense of reverence that uh, sucks the life of, out of it. Um, I've noticed that over recent years that there's been a tendency to equate slow tempos with something profound. Uh, you would never hear that in Toscanini or, or Kusevitsky, even Stokowski, um, that they really wanted to imbue the musical score with a, a sense of life. You know, when I hear Kusevitsky broadcasts uh, that uh, keep on coming to me and I'm not supposed to listen to, um, I'm thinking, oh my God, this is a Tuesday night in Providence. If I heard that, it would be on the 11 o'clock news. Uh, performance is exciting. Um, and so I, I think it's up to uh, the performers and presenters in the 21st century to realize that there's nothing wrong with music in and of itself. We need to have a responsibility to give it life, energy. Uh, and I think that's what's so important. Bravo. I agree. Thank you. So we, uh, from Mike, we have happy birthday, Marty. And a question, how can we persuade orchestras to play some of the music that you feel is underplayed at this time? Oh. <laughs> um, funny that you ask that because I, I consult with a number of, um, I, I consult with several people and I keep on trying to entice them to, um, um, I, I'll, I'll give you one example of the Toccata Concertante of Irving Fine, which I think is an absolute masterpiece. It's a virtuoso piece that Irving Fine uh, wrote for Kusevitsky's Boston Symphony, and I, for 10, 15 years, I, to anybody who would listen, say, this is a great piece, you need to conduct this, and they look at it, and they say, presenters will never go for it, uh, the, nobody knows this piece, and it's like, uh -huh. um, but once, once people hear this, it's like, oh my God, this is a great piece of music. Why doesn't people, why don't people play this? And so I think presenters are a little bit afraid of nobody's going to be willing to shell out 75 to $80 for a piece that they don't know. But I think conductors and presenters have to have um, a sense of confidence uh, with a music director who would say, um, Yes, this orchestra and this conductor, I will listen to them conduct a C major scale. And so that if you present the Chadwick Third Symphony or the uh, Piston Second Symphony, oh, well, I never heard this piece, but hey, this is a good piece. And then there's that sense of discovery, which I think is so essential in classical music. Thank you. 
Um, and another question from Francis, did Marty's path ever cross with Toscanini's? Hmm. I'm sure it did. I don't know. I'm sure it did. It had to. Um, I mean, he, uh, Toscanini was conducting in, uh, in, in April of 19, April of 1954. Certainly, uh, he, well, I know for a fact that he heard Toscanini conduct. I know that for a fact. Uh, but uh, personal uh, acquaintances with Toscanini, um, boy, <laughs> I, I'm sure he's sitting there yelling at me saying, yes, 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 <laughs> I did, I did. But uh, have I ever talked to him about Toscanini? I can't say that I have. Fair enough. Um, and uh, just a, uh, a funny little side note, his Toscanini's great granddaughter, Liana Toscanini lives here in the Berkshires and she's actually also teaching an Ollie class this semester along with this one. So oh, very good. Connection. So the final question is uh, just a very basic one, which is, is it possible to replay the first audio clip right now? Oh. Um, because just because the sound wasn't good. If it's not, and I understand it might not be able to because I know how complicated it can be, what we can do is we can email it out to everyone to listen to later so that, um, so that's another possibility. So if it's, uh, I know you have a lot on your computer with everything that you've been playing today. So give, would that be easier? Give me a second. Okay. Well, while, while you're doing this, I wanted to comment on something that Brian uh, mentioned. Uh, with regard to Irving Fine, Irving was one of Marty's teachers uh, at Harvard. He taught uh, Marty the subject of music 101. And he also encouraged Marty not to major in music uh, for various reasons. And as I mentioned, he uh, majored in German literature. But he also uh, feels that there are a number of underplayed, underappreciated uh, composers today, among them uh, William Schumann yep. uh, and um, Dvorak even, that Dvorak is not played nearly as much as it uh, might be, uh, and the composer um, Hansen as, as well. So, Howard Hansen. Yes, yep. Howard Hansen, thank you, thank you. All right, I have the I have the Previn birthday greeting all queued up here. Give me a uh, let me see if I can do this now. Today is an event for us, if not for you. Uh, it is my friend Marty Bookspan's birthday. Hey, well that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Happy birthday, Marty. I've I've learned. Over the years that in America a symphony orchestra consists of strings, brass, winds, percussion, and Marty Bookspan. <laughs> Often <does. laughs> yes. So uh, you are certainly an integral part of this orchestra and of quite a few others. And now that you're old enough to vote, I think that's something to celebrate. Well, they still ask to see a card when he wants a drink. As it should be, but happy birthday, Marty. Well, that was definitely worth the wait. That was, and what a wonderful way to end this really fascinating and, and delightful uh, conversation today. Thank you so much, Brian Bell. And thank you, Renee Rota, for another amazing uh, conversation. And uh, next week, we're going to have conductor and college president Leon Botstein. Botstein. We will. Next week or the week after? Next week, yes. And um, once again, we do have to move the time due to, you know, their busy schedules. So it will be again on Friday at 3 p.m. So next Friday at 3 p.m. We will send an email out to everyone to remind you with a um, revised link. And as always, if you miss one of the sessions or you want to watch it again, uh, just contact the OLLI office and we'll be happy to send you uh, the recording. So thank you, Brian, and thank you, Renee. Any last words from either of you? Thank you both, and I know I speak for all of us when we wish Marty a very, very happy birthday. Thanks, to everyone, for making it possible. And thanks for the opportunity to, to invite me, Renee. I've, I've had a blast, and uh, looking forward to uh, Stefan Deneuve, who I think very, very highly. I hope uh, 
I hope he's listening and happy birthday, Marty. Thank you. Thank you all. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>